Good morning everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh, Chief of Bureau with Aviation and Defense Universe. And we are here today to talk to Commodore, retired Commodore AJ Singh. Commodore AJ Singh has been with ADO for a very long time, has blessed us with his advisors. He is a part of our advisory team for right from the beginning. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. And today we are here to know from him uh, some insights on the Indian Navy as on 4th of December, we are going to celebrate the Indian Navy Day, which has been uh, celebrated. The theme has been celebrated as the Swarnim Vijayavash. Thank you so much for being with us, sir. And I will begin my session today with you by asking, is the Indian Navy of 2022 a formidable force? What are your insights on that? I think the Indian Navy today is amongst the largest navies in the world. We have capabilities which only the five big navies, that is the navies of the five uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council have in terms of being able to build an indigenous aircraft carrier, the INS Vikran, which was commissioned in September by the Prime Minister. We build uh, nuclear ballistic missile submarines. You've heard of the Arihant, which is a major strategic deterrent and part of the nuclear triad. So these capabilities, these are technologies which nobody else parts with and therefore you have to develop them yourself. And I think the Indian Navy done a remarkable job, Indian industry has done a remarkable job in being able to deliver these platforms. So when a Navy has this kind of capability, obviously it is a formidable Navy. If you see the force structuring of our Navy with aircraft carriers, submarines, destroyers, frigates, we are a blue water Navy with the aim of being able to project power in the Indian Ocean. India is now an emerging big power. Tomorrow we would like to sit on the global high table at the United Nations. For that sort of capability, you need to have a powerful Navy. Historically, if you see, it's countries with large navies which have generally dominated the world. And India would like to be in the same league. So the Indian Navy in the last few years has built up some very formidable capabilities. We are, uh, the Navy deploys its ships worldwide. If you remember on the 15th of August, on the 75th Independence, 76th Independence Day when we completed 75 years of independence, eight Indian warships were berthed in eight different ports across the world from South America all the way to Russia. We had managed to deploy these ships just to show that the Indian Navy now has the reach to be anywhere in the world at any time to protect India's maritime interests, which extend across the globe. So I think in terms of uh, the, the standing of the Indian Navy as a world-class force is very firm. It's established its credentials worldwide. Today, more than 40 navies want to exercise with the Indian Navy, uh, international Navy, uh, 40 foreign navies. So they would only do that if they think that they have something to learn from the Indian Navy. So some of the practices we follow, the interoperability we do, the way we deploy our ships and submarines, I think it's remarkable. And it is the hallmark of a very professional force. Uh, the way we reacted to the uh, to COVID, the way we've been able to evacuate Indians from various parts of the world whenever there's been a crisis, mm -hmm. the way we've been the first responders in a, in a humanitarian crisis, the day the tsunami hit Bombay, uh, hit India, uh, the Indian Ocean, in 26 December 2004, despite India having got affected so badly, by 12 o'clock in the afternoon that day, 26 ships and 15 aircraft had left harbour with pack, with relief material and medical teams, not only to the Indian cities which were affected like Chennai or Port Blair, but also to Thailand, also to Sri Lanka. We were the first to reach all these countries. And that, I think, really established the Indian Navy as a force to reckon with, as a future ready, uh, very capable force. And if you notice the way the Navy is being structured, you will realise that the Indian Navy has a, has a long-term plan mm -hmm. to be in the top few navies of the world. So it is a very formidable force, at, you know, in, to put it in, uh, in one line. Right, sir. So you began your comment with INS Vikrant. So we go from there. Indian Navy is the lead service as far as Make in India is concerned. So what should it do to become 100% Atmanirbhar? See, Atmanirbharta is different from indigenization. Very often the two are confused. Mm -hmm. Indigenization means that everything you can do in India. Yeah. Atmanirbharta means you're self-reliant. So it doesn't matter, even if some of your equipment is important, mm -hmm. you are self-reliant in that those people, it cannot be held against you. They cannot put sanctions on you. You should be able to remove that strategic vulnerability that you have of imported equipment and therefore it is very important. For example, just to give you an example, if tomorrow I were to, if I were to buy a marine engine, let's say from some other country, because I don't make that sort of a marine engine, thereafter I should have enough technology, I should be able to absorb of that engine, that anything that needs to be done to that engine thereafter, repair of the engine, maintenance of the engine, everything spares for the engine, I should be able to do it in India. So I'm self-reliant. And we must not try to become indigenous and self-reliant in every nut and bolt. We should focus our attention first on those technologies which nobody in the world is going to part with. 
to give us. Mm -hmm. We have to make those technologies. Small technologies we can get. More and more navies are now resorting to commercial off-the-shelf items, what we call COTS items, which are commercially available, laptops, computers, components, chips. So these are things which uh, support self-reliance. Doesn't mean that each and every nut and bolt, every pin has to be made in India. It is that you should have secure sources from where you will get what you need when you need it. Right. And there have to be able to do in India what you would otherwise have to rely on somebody abroad to do. That would be the ideal definition of self-reliance. Mm -hmm. The Navy has gone a long way in this. You know, we do not send ships abroad for refits. Mm -hmm. All our refits of all our ships and submarines are done in India. Mm -hmm. Which means that we have the self-reliance capabilities. We are self-reliant in ship repair. We are self-reliant in uh, in many, many areas. Mm -hmm. uh, our R&D effort, the R&D costs a lot of money. Yeah. All our, India is constrained by resources. We don't have the kind of resources the US has or amount China is being able to devote to its military development. Mm -hmm. But within the limited resources, I think we are doing a remarkable job, definitely. By these resources, do you mean the financial resources or the knowledge bank? I think both. But I think more financial. Mm -hmm. It's not that Indian engineers lack the skills. Yes. But once the finances are there, you can give them better training. They have more access to better equipment. They have access to better technologies. And they will deliver much better results. Okay. And look, we are a developing country. What we call the guns versus butter debate will always be here. Yeah. But so within the limited resources, we have to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And I think we are doing a fairly good job of it. Great. So when we talk about Indianization, it took India a long time to make its own indigenous aircraft carrier. So now, from here, do you think uh, now on was the process uh, and the time span that will take to make an, another one? It will be uh, quicker, it will be easier for India? Yes. You see, the first aircraft carrier, when you're building the first one, firstly, mm -hmm. the aircraft, an aircraft carrier is a very complex platform. It's not mm -hmm. a simple platform. It's a huge platform. It has to integrate aviation, the regular naval things like gunnery, weapons, mm -hmm. helicopters, planes, everything has to be integrated into one package. Mm -hmm. So building the aircraft carrier is tough. Here we not only built it, we first designed it. Designing an aircraft carrier is a big challenge. We designed it, we built it, we created an ecosystem in the country of tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 vendors. We trained the shipyard staff, so all that takes time. And that is why when we say we took 13 years to build the aircraft carrier, it is not too much by any, any stretch of imagination. So we should not, you know, criticize the establishment for saying, oh, it took 13 years to build an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. 13 years is not long for building your first aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. The second aircraft carrier will definitely be built faster because your vendors are in place. The people who are going to supply you spares are in place. They know exactly what you need. Uh, now, you don't have to keep qualifying them and saying, no, no, this is not how we wanted it. We wanted it this way. Now they know what you want. Your uh, shipyard team is uh, skilled in the welding techniques and putting things together and understanding the complexity of an aircraft carrier. So definitely the second aircraft carrier will be much quicker. What we are looking for, the Navy is looking for is a larger aircraft carrier. Looking for an aircraft carrier for about 65,000 tons. Yeah. Vikrant is 44,000 tons. Hmm. Because we need that strike capability, we need bigger aircraft, more powerful aircraft operating. We can, our range, will, our reach will be much more. Hmm. We'll be able to project power much further away. So we are looking for a much larger aircraft carrier. So it will take time, it will cost money, but this is an investment the country must make. Because what is what what worries me most is that Vikrant is ready, he's gone from the shipyard. Hmm. What's happening to all that trained manpower in the shipyard? What are they being utilized for? How will the shipyard justify that huge manpower resource which they've created to mm -hmm. build aircraft carriers if no further order comes for an aircraft carrier? And you don't want to lose the skill. Yeah. Similarly, the tier one, tier two, tier three vendors who are making parts now have no orders. They yeah. don't have orders now. So if that also has to be addressed, then we must, it should, you know, shipbuilding should be a series production. You cannot have build a ship, then do nothing for five years and then think you'll just take off from where you left off. It will not happen. We have, we learned a bad lesson, bitter lesson from the submarine program. We built submarines in the early 90s and then due to political reasons that program was scrapped. And today in 2022, we still can't build an indigenous conventional submarine. We are still looking for foreign support in the design and development of that. Right. So I think it's very important. We have to build a second next aircraft carrier. We have to make sure that the order is given soon because an aircraft carrier could take 10 years to build. To just to retain the, the skill sets that we have uh, we have established with great expense and with great uh, effort. Now, sir, in a recent defense conclave, you spoke about the maritime challenges India faces. There was a whole section that you spoke about it. So, what are the maritime challenges that India faces and is there a wish list that will get India at par with the best of the world? Uh, India faces a multitude of maritime security challenges. Maritime security challenges, you know, the nature of the maritime threat has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Earlier it was just state-on-state -state conflict, two countries fighting a naval battle with each other. Yeah. Now it has gone on to 
a much wider dimension of transnational threats, non-traditional threats. Maritime terrorism is one, piracy, gun running, uh, narcotics smuggling. There's so many things happening. Illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, which is known as IUU fishing, which is mm -hmm. which is probably the single biggest threat to the future of the oceans. Mm -hmm. uh, climate change is a huge problem. So these issues all constitute the so-called maritime security threat that, or challenge that India faces. Mm -hmm. So India has to structure itself uh, according to the Navy has to be structured to be able to counter these as well as take on the its its primary role of defending the country. Mm -hmm. We have a very, very potent uh, neighbor, adversarial neighbor China. We have on our west Pakistan, which has uh, always been sniping at our heels uh, over the last so many years. China and Pakistan have an unholy nexus between them. China is seeking to expand its footprint in the Indian Ocean. They will have a carrier battle group definitely in the Indian Ocean, permanently based by 2030. They have, they have established bases all over the Indian Ocean. They are creating support facilities everywhere. So they are going to be a very formidable naval presence in the Indian Ocean, both in the Eastern Indian Ocean and in the Western Indian Ocean. India has always been the predominant maritime power. India cannot afford to let this position get challenged by China. So we have to build up our capabilities accordingly to be able to counter the Chinese threat, to be able to contain the Chinese threat. It's not even counter, contain the Chinese threat. China has got a proxy state in Pakistan. It is arming Pakistan with submarines and ships and all kinds of things. Uh, AIP submarines, eight of them, four destroyers. So obviously these are part of China's larger strategy for the region. Mm -hmm. So if India has to uh, maintain and retain its combat edge in the Indian Ocean and a favorable maritime situation, we have to work towards that and navies don't get built in a day. You have to have a, 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 a constant stream of ships and submarines coming online because older ships keep getting replaced. So if you want to build up a navy, increase the strength, you have to be, you have to be building more ships than you're decommissioning. So I think from that point of view, India is trying to do that. 40 ships, I, I didn't mention, 39 ships are in build, 40 ships have an approval of necessity. How soon it takes place is a matter of you know budgetary allocations, mm -hmm. uh, political will, and that is very important. So if, a, if you want to build a navy, navy is like, you know, there's a common saying, it takes three years to build a ship, but 300 years to build a navy. Mm -hmm. So if we want to build a navy, the kind of navy we should have, we can't afford to say, oh, we'll wait another day and do it some other time. We have to make sure it happens now because everything for the and the navy we decide to build today or give orders for today will be the navy of 2030 and 2035 for us. Yeah. So that is important. So I think India is on the right track. We will remain a, a formidable maritime power in the Indian Ocean, one of the one of the, the primary maritime power. But we can't afford to sit on our laurels and say, oh, we are the maritime biggest maritime power. That position can get threatened very easily. Mm -hmm. Now, so something which everybody is talking about, the Russian-Ukraine war and how it is affecting us. So, is the war between Russia and Ukraine a hindrance to our spare supplies? See, firstly, I think the one message the world has to take away from the Russia-Ukraine war is that even if a war happens in one small little part of the world, really speaking, how does the Black Sea affect India? It doesn't affect India. It affects the whole world. It, it disrupts global supply chains. It, it, it creates uh, uh, inflationary pressures, economic uh, uh, economic challenges. So that is one message that this Russia-Ukraine war has brought. The second message it has brought home is that here was here you have one of the world's largest navies is fighting against a country which practically has no navy. And even then they have not been able to dominate the oceans. The ocean, the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, they have, Russians have established control, but they couldn't take Odessa. They lost their biggest ship. So it's not going to be easy. That is the message. Insofar as spares and supplies goes, look, we are dependent on Russia for almost 60% of our legacy equipment spares. Mm -hmm. And certain things used to come from Ukraine because Ukraine and Russia used to have a very comfortable defense industrial complex working together. Mm -hmm. We heard that the, the gas turbine factory has been damaged. We've yeah. heard various things. We, we've heard that Russia is you know, now focusing more on spares for its own military. Mm. How much of an effect it's actually happen, having on India, I'm not so sure because this is not something that's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. But certainly it will impact in some way the supply chain of spares coming from India. If nothing else, it'll be the cost which will go up because now make costs in Europe are going up for everything. Yeah. So if nothing else, that will get challenged. But this should also be, as I said, a transformational moment for us to now realize that even this is one area where we can't rely on anybody else. And perhaps we need to give it a push to ensure that we are not dependent on somebody else. This is a good opportunity. Right. So let's see. But I'm not so sure. It's not going to cripple our Navy, but certainly, yes, it is going to uh, throw up a few challenges in, in service and support. Okay. So most of our audiences know you as a submariner, something which is close to your heart. So my next question, finally, as a submariner, what do you think Indian Navy needs to look forward 
to enhance, to get to do more with the submarines here, the Indian submarines? See, submarines are basically of three types, right? We have the ballistic missile, nuclear armed submarines, which don't have a war fighting role per se. They are a strategic platform. They are a nuclear deterrent. We are very comfortable with that. We have one which has already been commissioned. The second one is getting ready. Two more are in build. And strategic deterrence, which is the role of the strategic submarine, has to be round the clock. Otherwise, its credibility is, has a question mark. Hmm. So to maintain a, one SSBN on patrol at all times, you need a minimum of four. Hmm. So once India has all its four SSBNs in place, which may take another five or seven years, we can confidently say that as far as strategic deterrence goes, our nuclear triad is complete and tested. So that is as far as the nuclear, pro the nuclear ballistic missile uh, strategic program goes. We are right. comfortably placed. Then you have the attack submarines, the SSN. You know, we used to get these SSNs on leads from Russia. The Chakra, you've heard of the Chakra, mm. that is an SSN. Mm. Any blue water navy, and India aspires to be a, is a blue water navy, aspiring to be a bigger blue water navy with aircraft carriers, requires attack submarines. Because attack submarines, along with the fleet and by themselves, are an extremely potent platform. Mm -hmm. And they can actually shape the maritime battle space. Right. Particularly in an open ocean environment. Mm. And that is what India is looking at. The Indian Ocean. We are not looking at exactly. the Arabians here, the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. That's part of it. But we are looking mm. at the larger Indian Ocean, or Indian even Indian that Ocean. larger than that, the Indo Pacific. Mm. For that, nuclear attack submarines are very important. This program has been going on for some time. Uh, a basic design review has been done. It went off successfully. Uh, a CCS paper for pro procurement of six, or rather, indigenous construction of six mm. uh, attack submarines is underway right now. But it's awaiting CCS clearance. So I'm sure some design work must be happening, but the contract has not yet been uh, awarded. Now, this the SSN is a very complex platform again, like the SSB and all the aircraft carrier. So it will take, I think, at least 10 to 12 years before our first SSN can come online from the time the contract is signed. So we have to do it sooner rather than later. If we want to have the sort of Navy we are talking of by 2035, if we want to have a Navy that can counter a Chinese naval presence, mm -hmm. we need to get cracking with that program now. Then we come to the conventional submarines, the SSK, the diesel electric submarines, mm -hmm. which we've been operating for the last uh, 54 years. Mm -hmm. We have, we have at the moment, old, we, have, we have five of the new Project 75 submarines, the Calvary class, which is being built in Bombay. Yeah. But our other submarines are all 35 years old. We need to replace these quickly. I mean, okay, they are sailing and everything, but age is age, you know, yes. technology-wise, every other way. So we have to replace these quickly. We have, we have a 30-year submarine plan which obviously is not, not moving at the pace at which it's supposed to move. Project 75 has held up for various reasons. Mm. So, the bottom line is that we need to build up our submarine capability quickly because this is a major constraint. Underwater is going to be very important in the future. And we need to build these submarines with the latest technology like air independent propulsion, lithium ion batteries, uh, the latest torpedoes, the latest missiles. We need to have a very potent, powerful uh, submarine force to counter the surface threat and the submarine threat which we will face over the next few years. Right. Thank you so much, sir. ADU really wishes you and all our Navy our best wishes with them who protect our seas, who protect us. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, Chatali. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.